Hello, hello. Hope you can hear me. It's <laughs> very unusual to talk uh, at Dev Club meeting with a microphone with loudspeakers, but I'll try to handle that. So I'm from uh, Codeborn. My name is Anton, and uh, at Codeborn we also do a lot of uh, interesting stuff. So we, we do we as we are like a consultancy company, we actually uh, tend to work on many different kind of projects, and uh, this is actually quite good for for you as an engineer, so you can actually try different stuff, try different kind of architectures and gain a lot of different experience. And uh, what inspired me uh, for this talk was uh, the internet banks that, that we do. We have launched uh, quite uh, a few of them. Uh, most of them are in Russia and, uh, and that's why uh, I realized how hard it is to do digital signatures outside of Estonia. So that's, uh, that's why uh, I wanted to share it with you. So how lucky are we actually living here? For, for us it's so easy. So I'll start with uh, some of the basics. I'm very sorry that I guess guys on the back don't see the bottom of the slides, but uh, hopefully it's not so, so important. So the, uh, <coughs> I'll give a quick introduction to, to this stuff, what's, uh, uh, what's digital signatures are. So, because when I actually gave this speech uh, on uh, Russian Dev Club, I realized that there are some people still, even among us developers, who don't know all the details. So uh, I try to cover the, the basics as well. So uh, encryption, or like ordinary people call it uh, ciphering, is uh, is when you transform data with a key. So you have some key, you have uh, input data, ABC, you transform it, you get DEF. For, for example, in this case, you just uh, shift every letter but same amount. So this is the key. So uh, <coughs> with uh, the PKI, with public key infrastructure, uh, uh, a key pair was introdu introduced. So it means that uh, you actually have two keys. So in the previous symmetric uh, encryption, you use only one key, and you use the same key in both ways, to encrypt that data and, and to decrypt. In this case, it's like number three. So you shift every letter by three letters among the alphabet. So in, uh, in a key pair infrastructure, you actually use one key to do the transformation one way, and another key to do the transformation back. So this is called as asymmetric uh, crypto cryptography. And uh, the important thing is that one of these keys is usually named private key and the other is uh, named public key. So the private key is kept secret. Uh, you, have, uh, you have it and uh, you never share it with anyone. And the public key, the, the sole purpose of it is that it's shared with the public. So uh, everyone can give, get access to it and actually, uh, for example, and to, to verify that you actually have the private key. So uh, private key usually is stored on uh, various kinds of devices. So in Estonia, one, the, the most common one is the ID card, which is a smart card which is actually the important thing about the ID card is that uh, uh, the keys are, cannot be extracted for it. They are unextractable. So uh, once the private key is generated, is actually generated by the smart card itself. Uh, the chip in smart card, it holds it and uh, there is uh, no practical uh, way of uh, getting it back. So, so this, this is the thing that uh, that actually guarantees that uh, you keep it secret and the card keeps it secret. And there is only one copy of it, so you cannot copy the ID card. So even if you give it for a brief moment to somebody, they cannot copy the card and uh, use, use uh, your keys uh, like uh, pretending to be you. So this is the most important thing. And uh, the public key is actually available on public servers. So and of course it's available on each side of the card. So the card itself is, it does all the mathematical cryptography algorithms. It's uh, in case of Estonia, it uh, implements the RSA, RSA algorithm. So uh, it's only, you can give it the input and you get the output back from the card. So 
uh, the, the cryptography is not implemented in the computer but inside of the chip <coughs> on the car. So mobile ID works the same way. So the, uh, the GSM SIM card is actually also, it has several applications and uh, it, it has uh, the same uh, pair of keys inside of the SIM card and it is the same way it never gives it back. <laughs> so it's generated once and then you can use it uh, to sign your documents. So uh, other uh, common, in common use things, so these, these are the things that we use in Estonia. In other countries, uh, uh, the most common thing is actually the USB token. I have uh, one here. It's, uh, it looks like the regular like memory stick or something like that, but in fact it is not. Uh, you, can, you can, of course you can store your private key on a regular memory stick as well. But uh, the problem would be that you can easily copy it from, from it. You can copy memory sticks. So these uh, sp special USB tokens, they actually are also designed, most of them are designed the same way as the ID card, so you cannot extract the private key from, from a token. So it will generate it and it uh, implements the crypt cryptography inside of it. So this uh, uh, concrete token that I'm showing to you is uh, from Russia and it actually implements the Russian cryptographic uh, algorithms, uh, not, not the RSA that uh, we use in the rest of the world. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, but the problem is that there are several, way, uh, several different kinds of these USB tokens and uh, the banks, when they want to implement the cryptography, they need to choose which one to use. And uh, if they pick the cheaper ones, then cheaper ones actually are not as secure. So from cheaper ones you can actually extract the private key and the cheaper tokens, they only act as a storage. So they, uh, they implement the, the private public key storage uh, uh, P PKCS uh, 11 uh, standard, so you can uh, talk with this stick the same way as you would talk with a smart card, but the thing is that you can extract the private key and the, usually the cryptographic operations are happening inside of the CPU on the machine. So, so there is always, for banks there is always a trade-off, so whether to buy the more, more expensive tokens and uh, uh, give to your customers or use the cheaper ones and uh, uh, use uh, less security. And for, uh, we, when we implemented our this, uh, cryptography for internet banks in Russia, we actually <laughs> needed to support both kinds. And not only the both kinds, there are even, uh, you can imagine there are lo lots of different uh, kinds of them, the manufacturers and whatever. So we, w we needed to test at least five or six different kinds and uh, change our software also accordingly to some of them. And the most insecure storage for your private key of course is your hard disk <laughs> hard drive on your machine so it's it can be very easily copied or stolen and uh, then the whole scheme of the digital uh, signatures doesn't work in this case so what a digital signature is digital signature is nothing else that but a proof that you own the private key so uh, so actually the possession of a private key is something that is uh, uh, guarantee that you is indeed you. So if you uh, lose this key, obviously uh, it's a very big problem. So you need to keep it secret and that's why uh, the ID cards and this kind of for hardware measures are uh, taken. So what is signing then? So signing is, uh, is that you take da data, you apply a hash function to it, Basically, the, the reason of the hash function is that if you have a very big data chunk, you actually compact it to something smaller. So the hash functions are lots of them. In Estonia, we used to use uh, SHA-1. Now uh, there is a transition to SHA-2 uh, groups of functions. There are several uh, which are in use uh, today on uh, some newer and older ID cards. So basically, you, you take a huge chunk of data, transform it to some like uh, reasonable chunk of data, like some uh, uh, like 64 bytes or even less. Uh, you get a hash, and uh, the 
where one very important thing here is that this hash, this function is one way, so you can never derive the data back from the hash. You can always take the data and calculate the hash, but you can never take the hash and derive the, the data. And uh, the strength of this function, of course, is very important, is that uh, it's not easy to find collisions or different kind of data that produce the same hash. But uh, why the hash is important is that actually this is what you encrypt uh, with, with your private key and you get the signature. So signature is, is actually an encrypted uh, hash with your private key. So it's known that if you are the only person who possesses the private key, then you are the only one who can actually use the private key to get this signature for this hash. So, uh, yeah, I'll just talk to you. So the, the current thing that we use uh, in Estonia right now uh, with newer ID cards is uh, uh, hash function is uh, SHA-256. And for some uh, root certificates, they use even uh, longer hashes. So uh, then how to verify this signature? So you also, to verify, you actually have the original data, of course. So uh, you can compute the hash again. Uh, it should be, if the data hasn't changed, then the hash will be exactly the same as was here. Then uh, you take the signature and you decrypt it uh, with the public key. So encryption was with private key, decryption with public key, and you should get the same hash. If uh, the hash that you obtained computed from the data and the hash that you decrypted from signature is the same, then the digital signature is valid. So it's uh, as simple as that. There are other uh, methods of doing that, but this one is so far the most popular based on RSA algorithms. So guard time guys, I don't know if there are anyone here, they are now proposing the different way of doing uh, digital signatures, which is pretty interesting. So, yeah. So the thing now, the important thing next is that, uh, how do I get the public key when, uh, when I want to verify a signature. So the public key is shared with the world and uh, it's usually put into a certificate. So the certificate is nothing else uh, but a public key plus the information of the owner. So basically you, you match the public key and the person who should be in possession of it. Basically in Estonia uh, it's, it's stored in a, in the X500 distinguished name in this format and uh, it's usually read as CN equals blah 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 and O equals blah 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 and in Estonia in the CN they usually put my last name, my first name, my uh, personal code and uh, then there are some other fields as well so uh, they can be so somebody who gets my certificate they, they can extract the public key for the verification of my signatures and they also can uh, be sure that this belongs to me so certificate in addition to that it contains a lot of different uh, uh, information that is useful for verification like the allowed key usage for example that this key is uh, only for authentication or is only for uh, digital signatures or and there are some other types that you can use. You can sign other certificates or you cannot sign other certificates, these kind of things. And also it contains the information of uh, where are the uh, some services that you can use for checking if this uh, certificate is still uh, valid, it's not revoked. Also a certificate has a, a valid until date, which is also very important, so they are re reissued periodically. So uh, the thing, next thing is that uh, there should be somebody who issues these certificates. And this is called Certificate Authority. And uh, the Certificate Authority needs, its job is actually to uh, basically somehow identify me uh, make sure that uh, I am exactly, I am in reality who I am, I am. and uh, they can, in this case, they can take my public key, which was generated by my ID card, and they can uh, apply a certificate to it. Basically, they wrap it into a certificate, and they add this needed, much needed metadata to my public key, so, so that everyone would know 
whose uh, public key is this. So they also need to maintain revocations. Basically, it means that uh, they need to keep track of the lost certificates, like the lost uh, ID cards. So in this case, they need to publish the information uh, that this certificate is uh, technically valid, but it's not valid anymore uh, because it was, for example, lost or stolen or abused in some other way. So, and uh, the, the, the bad thing about all this scheme is that the certification authority needs to be trusted by everyone who wants to participate in this scheme. So it should be a one central trusted authority. And uh, it has its own very big problems on the internet and uh, it has big problems on uh, uh, when, when you need to create your own service like uh, like an uh, internet bank who needs to act uh, as its own certificate authority. But uh, the good thing is how it was done in Estonia in year 2000 is... Uh, yeah, I didn't remember that I have this slide. <laughs> so yeah, the, the very important step for verif verifying of the signature is actually to check after technically everything matches, you need to check with the CA that, uh, that your signature, that the certificate is still valid. And it was valid at that time of uh, when the signature was done. So this is the crucial step that uh, some of the us, some of us developers forget and uh, it actually compromises the whole system. So uh, without this, uh, you, cannot, you, you never can uh, rely on the validity of the signature. So there are two protocols which are used for that. There's uh, either the CRL, Certificate Revocation List, or the OCSP, which stands for Online Certificate Status Protocol, I think, yeah. So the thing is that the CRL is just one single URL that you request, and you get the uh, basically the IDs of the revoked certificates back. So you can ask it uh, periodically, or you can download it this URL like uh, right before or after you are uh, verifying the signature or when you are making the signature, but the problem is that it can get huge. If the certificate authority is managing the whole country or even something bigger, then uh, it can be bad, bad big, <laughs> this uh, CRL file. That's why it's not very efficient. It works for offline purposes a little bit uh, better, but uh, OCSP is nowadays uh, more used is the uh, just the request re response type of service. Then you ask, say, please uh, uh, tell me about this certificate. Is it valid or not? And it replies basically yes or no, and some other metadata that you can embed in in the signature. So. Now the most important thing is that the best certification authority is the government, basically. So this was uh, shown, uh, this was, was Estonia actually showed to the whole world or in the uh, year 2000 when uh, 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 like a country level CA was established in Estonia and started certi certifying all the citizens. So why it's uh, it's, uh, it's very easy to do also for the government because the government already issues documents to the uh, citizens so they already have ways of verifying who a person really is and, uh, and they can, it's very easy for them to just add the, some of the, this digital cer certification uh, to that. That's exactly what, what we did. And uh, that's exactly what is absent in most of the other countries uh, in the world, unfortunately. So there is no uh, centralized uh, certification authority, digital authority, who would certify all the people. So in Estonia, we can build a, a web service and rely on, uh, on that every person uh, should be able to have uh, a public key and, and private key for digital signatures. and. Uh, in Russia, for example, where we work, it's, uh, it's actually impossible. Uh, so you need to create everything by yourself from scratch, but more on that later. So it certifies every citizen, provides keys on physical tokens, like on ID cards, and, uh, and it revokes 
it manages all the stolen stuff, all the governments already have this in place. And uh, also what is very important that it standardizes file formats or otherwise it would be quite hard uh, to exchange the digital signatures if I only would send you somebody some bytes and say hey this is my signature please verify it. So the person who is receiving that they need to have the software, they need to know what kind of format it is, uh, how to interpret all this data. So what in Estonia was done also is was uh, developed a standardized first uh, file format that was uh, first uh, which was really in practical use. One question. Yes. The, how does ESCO fit in there? Because ESCO is not the government. Yeah, it is not. I'm going to clarify that a bit okay. soon. So it's also standardized algorithms. So for example, in Estonia, they picked the, the SHA-1 and uh, RSA and the key size and whatever, so that all the citizens will have the same. So it provides the software to end users. It provides libraries to developers and online services also, uh, like the government services or the uh, digidoc dot sk dot e if you know it so where you can actually without even having much of the software on your computer you can actually use it for reading and writing of this uh, signature formats so this is all very important so now going to Estonia in year 2000 2000-2001 it's uh, when the Estonia passed a law uh, that the dig digital signatures are actually uh, as valid as the like the paper signatures are and Estonia wasn't the first, I actually checked uh, many Estonians think that Estonia was the first in the world to do that, actually it was not but uh, Estonia was the first one who started the practical use of uh, this kind of law so most of the countries they actually created this kind of laws in uh, like the during the 2000, 2001 and Estonia was like, it was one of the first and I'm, I'm not pretty sure uh, who was the, the first one, it's quite difficult to find this kind of information on, on the internet. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Estonia started practical use of that. So there was a tender for who would be the, uh, the governmental CA or the official CA of Estonia. And, uh, and uh, SK, which is a private company, it actually won this tender. So, that's, uh, that's how it, it works unt until now. SK was actually created by two banks, by uh, now uh, Swedbank and SEP. These were the two banks who actually created this company as a joint venture because banks were the most uh, interested in uh, these kind of things that it will be available to everyone. And uh, the good thing that government did is that actually it did the tender, it did the law and uh, these kind of things. And uh, the thing was that uh, in uh, early 2001 uh, they started issuing ID cards with uh, private uh, keys on, on them to all the citizens. So by, by the end of the 2002 there were more, more than 100,000 of them and most of the people who got them they just thought it was a, a convenient way of uh, a convenient document so you don't have to carry your large and bulky passport around so you can use this small uh, credit card sized thing very convenient but most people didn't realize what that chip there is for and uh, by the time then uh, there were al already plenty of services uh, like you could log in to internet bank and do different kind of stuff with your ID card many people started only then they started realizing that uh, the keys needed for that are already in their pockets so that was the very uh, genius thing to do to, in my mind and uh, this what Estonia done uh, did very right because uh, many other countries in the following years they followed they started uh, also creating some uh, issuing smart cards with the uh, private keys but uh, the problem was that uh, <coughs> in most cases these cards were uh, you needed to pay for them and uh, they weren't uh, in one package with your ID so basically you needed to have your ID separately like a passport and you needed to have this card separately and of course uh, nobody had enough motivation to go and uh, request this card and pay money for it then if they if nobody knows how to use it or how it works. So in Estonia the good thing was that uh, it was already in people's hands when uh, people started realizing that uh, they can uh, use it to digitally sign stuff. That's what bootstrapped the whole digital signature and uh, 
uh, maybe IT uh, like services uh, in Estonia. So yeah, so it was people wanted to get it as a travel document. So it implements like most of smart cards. It implements this uh, standard. It's basically a standard which defines the. Uh, file system inside of the smart card how the things are stored so how you can request uh, request different uh, certificates and keys and uh, as is widely known in uh, Estonian ID card there are actually two private keys and two public keys so can anyone tell me why do you need two Yes, yeah, so it's for authentication and signing, of course, and I think most people know that, but uh, why do you use different ones? Not why can't I use everything with one key? Not to mess away your signer when you... There's an idea from first row from the girl. So that you can have a control on what operation you are currently conducting. Yeah, that's a very correct answer. Basically, it means that because authentication and digital signing, they are essentially the same process. So when you're authenticating yourself, you're also digitally signing some hash that the server sends to you. And uh, so in this way, when you have separate certificates and separate PIN codes for both, both of your keys, then you can maybe be sure that uh, if you log in, that nobody will actually put, uh, give you a, a hash of some document that you didn't sign. And uh, then they will be able to reconstruct uh, a valid digital signature for this document. So in order for this not to happen, you have two different keys and two different pins. And you can, yeah, you can control which operation you're currently doing, whether you're signing or you're just logging in. And because logging in is something that you do much uh, more often than uh, then it's actually quite dangerous if uh, you use the, the same key. The problem is that most of the other governments who followed Estonia, they didn't get that. So they actually use only one private key and one public key on, on a smart card, most of them. So that's a very huge question mark for me. Why, why do they do, do that? So yeah. <coughs> Now about the format. So uh, in that time they have developed uh, TigiDoc format, which was based on Xadas. Xadas was all already a standard somewhere, but it wasn't quite ready for the practical use. So they needed to extend that, and they re uh, named it uh, DigiDoc inside of Estonia. So there was a second format also called CDoc. It's for encryption, but it's not very widely used except for a trafficked uh, camps, I think, which are very annoying. They, they usually send the fine in the C doc, and you need to have exactly, you can decrypt it with exactly one ID card. If you're using also mobile ID, you can still, you cannot decrypt it with the other's private key. Because when they are encrypting, they need to ch choose which of your public keys do they use for encryption. And then they usually choose the one that's on an ID card, and uh, it's nowadays it's more convenient to use mobile ID and forget about this card reader, and uh, it's usually a pain to decrypt it. By the way, which one of the uh, keys, uh, which one of the key pairs on your card is used for uh, encryption? The first one. The first one, yes. Why? Because it's used for authentication. So that's a different type of uh, user shows the key. It's your personal authentication, so you're authorizing that you know, this person and you are getting this data. Yeah, but basically, yeah, the, the reason is the same, that digital signature is uh, legally binding uh, stuff that uh, is uh, much better to keep it separate from the rest of the uh, operations. And maybe having three keys would be impractical, so it's uh, quite okay to do to use the same card that you use for authentication, for decryption. Because decryption is basically also an, an authentication. So you are proving that you are the one, the, the, the guy who is having this key, so you can read this document. So desk, desktop software libraries, browser plugins, portals, everything was provided. Uh, at first it was Windows only, then uh, 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 SK actually uh, I uh, used uh, uh, Codeborn also at one point to improve uh, and make this, uh, all this infrastructure cross-platform. So actually we have participated in uh, some of the 
steps of development of this new new software which is available now. So there's the QDigitoc, there's uh, also a QSID util which is used for just reading the information from your ID card. There is the JDigitoc, Digitoc for J now and uh, other Digitoc uh, Digi libraries for different kind of languages that developers can use to create the services to actually uh, talk to this, uh, to, to do the digital signatures. There is the, the portals like id.e where you get your software from and there is the, uh, some other government services and whatever. So actually this all is pretty hard. There's a lot of stuff actually that the uh, government needed to do to make it all working. So uh, it sh shouldn't be like underestimated the, this effort because when you need to do it uh, by yourself in a different country you need to create all the infrastructure by yourself most of it so some like the basic rough timeline of stuff that happened later that in 2005 Estonia was the first country in the world to do the electronic voting using the digital signature not the machines with buttons yes no like was used uh, which was used in UK or the United States uh, then there was in 2007 uh, there was a very big innovation called mobile ID so I read uh, a news uh, recently that it's now finally getting more popular. Before that only like the developers with a banking background uh, mostly used it. Uh, now uh, there are lots of people like I think it was like uh, 200,000 so I don't remember. It was I uh, know it was more than 100 for sure in a few days ago there was a news but Anyway, there is now more than it was you used to be before. And uh, the thing is that now some of Estonian companies also are bringing it to other companies. Like it was brought to Lithuania like a couple of years later. So Lithuania now also is enjoying mobile ID, but they don't have a national ID card. And uh, it is also now launched in Ukraine and some other uh, countries. So it's a pretty good success story as well. And uh, 2010, uh, all this stuff was, all the code was open sourced, and uh, now it's on GitHub even. Uh, so uh, lots of companies nowadays they actually take advantage of that and uh, try to be consultants for other countries to build something uh, similar that was built in Estonia. But Question. it's a good thing. Do you know like, who maintains the GitHub repository then? I think I think the last one who actually it it's officially job of Ria, but uh, they actually have uh, they publish tenders and uh, the previous maintainer was SK, okay. and SK they actually used some other companies like ours to to do the job, and uh, I think it has changed uh, lately. So probably uh, it's not SK anymore who is doing that, but somebody else I don't remember who thank you so yeah so another very big innovation that happened uh, uh, like two years ago and it's still still happening right now is the new uh, signature format it's called BDOC I don't remember what B stands for like something like something good binary binary Bindas. yeah what is it Bindas. Baltic, yeah, <laughs> that, that was a theory about Baltic, actually binary I think is more um, uh, logical because it really is binary finally because the, the big problem with uh, Digidoc was that it was an XML file and if you wanted to sign some binary document like PDF or something then you would uh, convert it to base64 and put it inside of this XML. So basically these uh, Digidoc files, they were always uh, like two times larger than the original files uh, that they are containing. So uh, the, this BDoc is much better, it's actually finally a binary format which is also uses the compression. So it's uh, in fact BDoc file is a zip file. So it's uh, conformant to, uh, I think the, the whole idea came from the a European standard, so the, uh, there is now a European standard which is called uh, ASIC. ASIC it stands for, let me remember, it was uh, Associated Signature Container. So it basically means that uh, you don't have only the signature, 
but you have a, a container file which contains all the signed documents and the signature and metadata, everything in one, in one file. So this is also a very uh, important thing because uh, in Russia many of the signing services they actually operate with detached signatures and detached signature means that you have the file that you signed and you have the signature file, two separate files and it's uh, much less convenient actually to send them around or whatever, you can l lose one and not the other and uh, the problem with uh, uh, ticket doc file was that you it, if you don't have the official like software that supports it, you couldn't extract the files. But with BDoc, the good thing is that uh, because it's a regular zip file, you can actually extract it and you, you can get the, the signed file, the original files, uh, even without uh, supporting the validation of signatures and something like that. I actually wanted to show it to you how it looks like. Uh, so. I have uh, a couple of files here, so if we open a Digidoc file in, uh, let me see, some text editor. Ah. Let's open this. <laughs> let me see, can it actually do that? Mm. Okay, I was prepared to showing the the other ones. So you can obviously open with, open it with uh, with the Digidoc client. So, yeah, let's open it with this one. So it basically looks like this. So you have an XML. It's a signed doc. There's a da data file, base 64, and here it goes. <laughs> So not, not very efficient. And uh, at the end there are signatures. So if I scroll down here, there are some certificates and signatures and stuff uh, which are like, and some roles and whatever. Every file can have several signatures. And the important thing is that all the certificates actually, they are inside of this file also. So this container file, it actually contains everything to validate the signature. It also contains the OCSP response with the timestamp embedded in it. So you can check that at that time uh, when the signature was done, it was actually a valid certificate and these kind of things. So it's everything good except for the format. So if we open the BDoc file, we can open it with Digidoc client, of course, or we can open it with a regular some zip utility and you can see that there is a file that is uh, uh, signed here. These are uh, example files from SK sites, it's not mine. <laughs> and uh, there is an uh, important thing that there is a MIME type, which is actually, this is the, uh, the official MIME type of uh, ASIC-E. Uh, ASIC-E also stands for extended format, because extended means that it can contain uh, several signed files inside of it. So the there is also a simpler version of ASIC which uh, can sign only one file. So ASIC-E only in this kind of zip format. And there is a meta-inf directory very familiar to Java developers. Um, there are two things like manifest which actually lists, uh, lists the files which are there in the, in the container and it also has uh, signatures which is also in XADES format. So as uh, the regular Digidoc, it was uh, 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 the XADES, regular XADES and this format is actually the detached XADES. So uh, ASIC-E also supports uh, binary signatures as well. So you can replace this uh, signature XML with uh, signature P7S which would be in uh, CADES format. Uh, it's uh, instead of X, not XADES, but CADES. Uh, it's, uh, it's a binary format, but it basically contains all the same data, all the same metadata. And here we also have the certificates and uh, all kind of timestamps, so CSP responses and whatever. But the thing is that you can uh, re read it all even without a specialized software. You can also can notice that it's also compatible with open document format. It's actually specif specifically specified at the ASIC uh, spec that uh, the software that can read the general open document format, this is the one that the OpenOffice or LibreOffice uses, uh, then it can actually understand this stuff and extract data from it.
So, and it's also uh, the dgdoc utility, it can also produce a different kind of file, which is not bdoc, which is with the extension of uh, ASIC-E. So this is the regular ASIC-E, which is not uh, for internal Estonian use, but this ASIC-E is guaranteed for interchange uh, in the whole European Union. So when, if you want to give a signature that will be understood by, by, I don't know, somebody in Lithuania or Portugal or whatever, then you need to uh, change the file format in your Digidoc utility when you are doing the signing. So it can produce this standardized uh, type of file. The difference between them is the, how timestamp is stored. So uh, in the Estonian version, it's simpler, the timestamp is called now officially time mark. It's stored inside of the uh, OCSP response. So there's only one request during the signing that uh, at, uh, do t does two things. So it uh, replies with the timestamp, which is signed, and it replies with the uh, validity data for a certificate. So uh, with the ASIC E, which is the very standard ASIC E. Uh, you get, uh, you need to have two separate services. One is the OCSP and the second is the timestamping service. And uh, the timestamping response is also embedded uh, into the file. But uh, the rest of the stuff is, is the same. I compared them yesterday. So, and uh, in 2015, we also were the first one to do the uh, e-residency, the very cool stuff. And uh, there's also some plans now to change the signature algorithm from RSA to uh, elliptical curves. Uh, right now it's already done for the new uh, issued mobile ID cards. So if you get a new mobile ID now, you will probably will be getting not the RSI keys, but the elliptical curve uh, keys. For ID cards, for some reason, they still uh, use uh, RSA. And I think from March we will start, they will increase the key size of RSA. Yeah. How can you check? You have uh, if you have your ID card, you can uh, download. Mobile ID, how can you check which cryptography? You can, uh, the easiest way, I think, is to use the signature, is to sign something. Then you can open your signature, you can uh, extract your certificate. And inside of the certificate, there is uh, a key, and the type of the key is written. So there's lots of interesting data inside of the certificate, so if, if you dare to look at it. So, yeah. The problem with, uh, with all this stuff is that uh, this is quite an old map, but still it's, um, it's uh, not m much has changed since. So basically there are very few countries uh, in the world who actually deployed the uh, electronic ID with the digital signatures. There are some uh, countries, most of the countries in the European Union are now trying, M many of them are looking at Estonia and uh, trying to learn the stuff. But for example, one very notable country, one of the biggest is Germany. They have issued the new uh, national ID card uh, last year. Uh, it's not a cheap card. It's an RFID card, which is also an interesting innovation. But uh, they now use it only for authentication. They don't use it for digital signing. And they say that they maybe some, someday we will start signing with it as well. But. Uh, the, the, uh, unfortunately, still, most of the countries are very far behind. So now if we get to Russia, then Russia is uh, the title that's your <laughs> on your own. It actually, it's, it's also true for most of other countries, uh, especially outside of the European Union. So it has all the necessary laws, and actually most of the countries, uh, if, you, if you look at the map uh, of the countries who have the digital signature laws, then I think there are more than 100 countries who do. So, uh, so there is very hard to find a country which doesn't have the laws nowadays. But they don't have the infrastructure, and that's why these laws are not being used at all. So. In Russia, they use different kind of algorithms, which come from ghost uh, family. Uh, this is called ghost R3410, to be more specific, and the, the hash function is 3411. Uh, the cool thing about Russia is that their algorithms, uh, they all use elliptical curves. Why elliptical curves are better in some way than RSA is that RSA needs to have very long keys. So in order to keep uh, RSA secure, the size of the key is uh, inc increased all the time. So the first ID cards, they were with uh, 
I don't remember if there were any ID cards with one kilobyte keys, uh, but most of the cards are with two kilobytes, and now they are uh, thinking about doing the four kilobytes keys. So uh, the thing is that if you take the elliptical curves, they also the the RSA algorithm is based on factoring the prime prime numbers. Elliptical curves is based on some. Uh, other big <laughs> elliptical curve uh, mathematical equation, which is also very difficult to solve from, from the uh, wrong end, basically. <laughs> so the thing is that uh, the keys are much shorter. So if you take a, a, a key which is like 300 bits, it can be as secure as four kilobyte RSA key. So, and uh, in the result, the digital signatures themselves are also much shorter with the elliptical curve. So it's, uh, less transmission and this kind of stuff. So uh, all the certificates, whatever needs to be signed, so they are all smaller if you use the elliptical curve. So in Russia, they use uh, 512 uh, bit keys. And uh, these are, uh, for a very foreseeable future, are much more secure than four, four kilobyte uh, RSA keys. So the, the trick is that in Russia, all the software needs to be certified by FSB. So if you do any of the cryptography related stuff, if you implement everything by yourself uh, in order for the court to accept your digital signatures, uh, your software needs to be certified by FSB. So you need to apply for the license, you need to, they need to review your code and whether or if you get your uh, license, uh, then you cannot make any change to your code. So if you want to release a new version, you, you need to go through all the hell again. So obviously not many banks or companies like ours need to want to do that. But there are some tricks. Uh, the software that is FSB certified is expensive, it's hard to work with, and it's mostly Windows only, of course, like uh, it's uh, in most cases, like it was in Estonia, but in Estonia it was for free. Uh, one of them, the biggest player is Crypto Pro. There are similar. So the problem is in Russia that uh, the companies uh, created a huge business out of these digital signatures. So that's why it's quite difficult to get into this stuff. So in order to accept and uh, do the digital signatures, you need to uh, pay lots of different guys lots of money to. You need to pay for the certification center software, need to pay for the licenses or for the software that the use end users will install on, install on their own machines to do the uh, stuff. You need to pay for the software that is going to verify. And uh, the problem is then there is no national standards of file exchange formats and whatever. And uh, it means that uh, every vendor is incompatible with the other. So if you choose one, then you cannot easily interoperate with the other. And uh, some poor users who need to access several banks, they end up with uh, a huge amount of uh, these kind of keys, uh, USB tokens, that they need to remember which one to plug in to do the digital signature. So it's uh, like orchestration was a topic of the last talk. So this is what the end users are doing in Russia. So no official uh, CA. There are uh, there are several uh, which to whom you can pay and to whom a regular person can come and request a certificate, pay to them and bring your own key. They will uh, <coughs> write your certificate there. But of course nobody does that because it's too inconvenient, too much hassle to do that. So do it yourself stuff and. Uh, what what means to do it yourself, the digital signatures? It's actually about that much of stuff. So how are we on time? We're Maybe five to ten minutes. Okay. So uh, first you need to create your own certification authority uh, inside of the bank, for example. It means that uh, you need to also generate and uh, <coughs> and uh, manage a uh, minimum of three levels of uh, certificates. So because the PKI infrastructure, it works uh, by trust, and usually users, they trust the root certificate, and uh, it means that if the root certificate is compromised and you have already issued a thousands of, uh, of end user certificates, then it's a pretty bad situation. So that's, that's why usually people don't use only two levels of certificate, they add an intermediate level. So there is a root certificate that, that issues an intermediate certificate 
and the intermediate certificate issues the end user certificate. So it's a minimum of three levels. Each of these levels needs to have their own uh, OCSP and CRL endpoints uh, and uh, all kinds of uh, management stuff. So it need to, you need to actually revoke them, be able to revoke, reissue them and whatever on all, all the levels. Of course, uh, you need to try to keep your root certificate intact as much as possible. And um, uh, then, uh, yeah, you need to issue at, at every level there are different kind of sequence of uh, serial numbers uh, that need to be managed. You need to make sure that you are not issuing some uh, uh, two certificates with the same serial number because all of the protocols like OCSP and CRL they are based on serial numbers of the certificates. So you need to securely store private keys that you use for issuing and your private keys for the root certificate and uh, if you don't trust your system administrators that's an even big, bigger hassle because uh, then all these HSM this kind of hardware based uh, like security modules come into place that you need to be able to talk to uh, from your software, it's pretty big hassle uh, to do to do that all. And um, the problem with uh, lawyers in Russia, particularly, is that <coughs> they think that uh, you cannot uh, issue only one certificate to one physical person and be able to use it uh, in different companies. For example, it's a very normal situation that uh, one person represents uh, several companies and uh, in the internet bank, but in Russia they cannot have one single private key to represent different internet banks. I tell them that, come on, when I sign something with, on paper, then if I represent one company or the other, I always sign the same. So I don't have two different signatures for different kinds of situations. Uh, but, uh, but for digital signatures, for some reason, they want to have different private keys for every kind of situ situation, which is also an even bigger nightmare for, for the developers because even more certificates that we need to manage and see and uh, there are quite uh, difficult and uh, complicated graphs of this uh, <coughs> repre uh, representation stuff and certificates are actually created uh, in our uh, systems so it's quite sometimes quite difficult to understand who can represent whom and uh, which certificates uh, can be used for what and who can use them, whatever. Uh, so in, in Estonia, fortunately, we, if I have one, my personal certi uh, certificate and I can represent several companies, I use the same keys, which is very obvious and easy. So you need to have the administration interface, you need to have the uh, tools to manage all that. So the, the keys and certificates to the UI for for the bank tellers who would issue the certificates, upload them to these uh, uh, USB keys and uh, issue them uh, to end users and uh, revoke them, the customer support and somebody calls, say I have lost my USB key, what should I do? And they, they need to revoke that and this kind of stuff. All the tools you need to create by, by yourself. Uh, then uh, the hardware, you need to choose choose the tokens that you are going to support. And we have tested, as I already told you, uh, quite many uh, before the bank actually chose one primary token and they are still using from time to time the others. Unfortunately, they chose the less secure ones because they are cheaper. So uh, that's uh, like a lot of trade-offs here. And uh, well, when we test this stuff on our own PC, we also we need to plug a lot of different tokens when we test uh, our code. Because uh, uh, many of these tokens, uh, the, the most crazy stuff about this hardware stuff is every type of token requires its own Windows drivers. So, of course, why I'm saying Windows, because most of the stuff magically works on other operating systems, but on Windows everything needs its own driver. So, uh, and uh, of course the bank is responsible of, uh, of getting this driver to the uh, end user's PC. And uh, of course you can imagine how many different kind of PCs and configurations are there. So this is also a nightmare for Estonian ID card software development. So you need to make sure that these things install on all kinds of different versions of uh, operating systems and whatever. And, uh, and there's a lot of people probably who are, who are dealing with that on, on a government level, but in Russia every bank needs to do this 
by themselves. They need to create the installer that would install the root certificates to the machine of the customer, then it will install the necessary software, uh, the browser plugins, because the Internet Bank works in browser, and uh, so that we can uh, do the signatures from JavaScript. And in many cases, we needed to. Uh, and what is even more crazy in Estonia, you only have one plugin that is used for uh, signing of stuff. So for authentication, you don't need any plugins because uh, the client-side certificates are already supported by most of the browsers. Uh, and the, the thing uh, here is that uh, there is not only a plugin for signing, you need to also issue new, new certificates uh, on the client machine. So the, the whole scheme works uh, that way. So. Uh, because the bank also doesn't trust the teller, and maybe the, the person, maybe the bank trusts the teller, but maybe the person who received the token doesn't, probably doesn't trust the, the teller too much. So the scheme is like this. So when I come to the teller, they, get, uh, they give me a USB token with the incognito key. So this is the key which is, not, uh, which is like attached in the system to me, but is not valid for signing yet. So when I come home, I need to actually regenerate uh, new private keys, which uh, uh, the bank teller didn't see. Especially that the tokens are not too secure, so the bank teller actually can uh, extract the private key and then use it parallelly with me or sell it to someone. So uh, what I do then before I start signing, I actually uh, make a new certificate request with uh, <coughs> generate new pair of keys, make a new certificate request, send it back to the bank, to the certification authority that we created. It will, uh, uh, and this certificate request, it's not only signed with the private key or with the new private key, is also signed with the old private key. So when it's sent to the bank, we verify that it's, uh, the old private key is valid, the signature with the old private key is valid, then we need to check the new private key, and if the signature is valid, then we uh, get the guarantee that this person is uh, really the, uh, in possession of this new private key, as well as the old private key. So it's basically the same person who have received the anonymous token, and then they, we issue a new certificate that uh, we need to upload back to this USB thing. And we need to do that everything by ourselves inside of our internet bank. And of course, uh, you can imagine how many steps are there, and, uh, and uh, most of them are related to the hardware thing. So it's quite difficult to work with hardware from the internet browser. And, uh, in, and, it's, uh, and then you, you should do the signing as well, that is uh, the regular stuff. So, uh, yeah, I already talked about the inst installer that you need to provide and the plugins and everything. And uh, of course, uh, if, you're, if, if you're crazy enough uh, and if you're not tired enough, you can uh, support, uh, you can do it cross-platform. You can start supporting the Mac or Linux or whatever. And uh, it's also quite difficult, especially it's very difficult to get Windows working where the 90% of these uh, users are sitting and, it's, uh, then, and then you need to start over and to go through the other operating systems. Also quite, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, yeah, and lots of different kind of web UIs. And uh, you need to choose the file format <coughs> that you will use for uh, the exchange of the digital signatures. So, uh, for example, we have chosen two. We use, uh, and i tell you why. Uh, we, we chose uh, the uh, CADIS for the regular uh, signatures because CADIS is sort of a standard somewhere and uh, it's based on uh, PKSCS7, which uh, uh, then there was a CMS, another extension of it which is called CMS, Cryptographic Message System. And then there was CADIS, which is based on, on CMS, this kind of thing. So we can create them programmatically well, pretty easily. In Java, we use Pouncy Castle for that. Uh, it has the built-in stuff, so we don't need to write all this crazy code uh, by hand. And uh, uh, we use PADES for the documents which are signed by the bank. PADES is, uh, uh, is basically a PDF with embedded uh, signature. It's also now a standard uh, in some ANSI, whatever, 
<coughs> and uh, the thing, the good thing about Pares, the Cades is also a container format. So you embed your signed files inside of the single file, and it has all the metadata, like the uh, ASIC E files that we have now in Estonia. And uh, Pares, uh, and the thing is, in order to read this file, you need to have a specialized software. And most people don't have it, and it costs uh, money to actually. Uh, to, to, to have the uh, client-side software. So uh, what we use for the bank uh, signatures is that, for example, when you request your account statement and you want it to be signed by the bank, then in this case, uh, Pardes is very good because you just get a regular PDF file. You can read it with any PDF viewer. And uh, if your viewer supports the Pardes extension, then it will see the signature and will be able to verify that as well. But it's all in one file, and the biggest thing here is that you can actually read this file without any specialized software. So this is uh, why this Pardes is so good uh, for us. So we needed to implement both. And uh, we needed to find a software for verification that the bank would use, and this software needs to be certified uh, by FSB because uh, uh, if you go to the court with that, then you need to also prove that the stuff that uh, well, the certified software actually can uh, use that. And uh, on the client side, unfortunately, we had to use uh, this uh, Crypto Pro uh, uh, software that actually talks with the tokens, uh, which uh, the bank needs to pay for, for every installation. So uh, when this installer is generated, then there is a part of the software, some CSP for, uh, created by Crypto Pro, which uh, our browser plugin is talking to to talk to the token, and uh, sometimes uh, for the for the tokens which uh, use the built-in cryptography inside, which are unextractable, for these kind of tokens there is even uh, other drivers that we need to talk to from the plugin, so uh, to to get the signatures and stuff. And, uh, and this, uh, this Crypto Pro stuff, or these tokens themselves, they are FSB certified. So in, in this case, this is legally OK, uh, the, the whole scheme that we're using, despite uh, having uh, written most of the other infrastructure by hand or using open source tools. Uh, and for signatures themselves, you can <coughs> this also is true for Estonian use cases, that you <coughs> need to choose the format in which uh, is the data that you are actually signing. <coughs> for example, in Swedbank, some many, many years ago, then we have implemented this digital signing. <coughs> Sorry. We have chosen a PDF so that uh, the, the payment data is put to PDF, then PDF is signed, converted to Digidoc, then this Digidoc is stored for like many, many years so that you can go to the court if, if needed with that. So uh, here we, man, uh, we went the easier way because the PDF is quite big, it's quite a lot of storage is needed for, uh, because there are lots of payments being made every second. So <coughs> we actually chose a plain text file for the payment data. So basically it's like the Java properties file, it's key value plain text file where all the important data of the payment is stored or the other document that the person is signing. And then it is signed and put into CADES format and it's, uh, then it's not uh, as large and uh, it's uh, easier to, to store it and, and copy around. And uh, anyway, most of the people in Russia, they don't have any software to view these files anyway, so it doesn't matter if it's PDF or plain text file. So th those who can read these files, then they can uh, read the plain text file as well. And uh, yeah. So, and uh, basically we have written most of the stuff in Java, of course, and JavaScript. So, uh, what was a very good thing that we have discovered is that Bouncy Castle, it actually implements these ghost uh, algorithms. And uh, only starting from version 1.5, it's compatible with the signatures that Crypto Pro <coughs> certified software is uh, uh, giving. So the thing is, as I already told you, that the elliptical curve uh, keys, they actually have uh, lots of parameters. So uh, with RSA it's uh, quite easy. If you have the key, then uh, it has all the information to, to use it. Uh, with the elliptical curve you have a short key and you have lots of uh, uh, like uh, 
predefined uh, constants that are used uh, with the elliptical curve itself. So basically we need to have the definition of the elliptical curve itself in order to use the keys which are used with this elliptical curve. And uh, these constants, there are lots of them which are needed also together with the key. Uh, they are in Bouncy Castle only starting from this version, that w which are really compatible with the market leader that the, uh, there is in Russia. So, and uh, it can, Bouncy Castle can nicely be used. It's not very easy. There are quite a lot of APIs, but basically you can generate and read all these kind of different files uh, that you need to use when you are implementing your own certificate authority. So the certificates, uh, certification request, the certificate itself, the certificate revocation lists, the OCSP request and responses, the CARES and CMS, all of this actually they use the data structure which is uh, also a hierarchical uh, structure like XML is, but it's a binary. It's called uh, ASN1 encoding. And ASN1 uh, is the basis of the DER file format, if you have heard about it. So most of this stuff is actually stored in this uh, uh, structured format, structured binary format that you can actually generate and parse using Bouncy Castle. And uh, I don't have time for that, unfortunately. I even brought the table here to show you some code. But anyway, you, I have some code on GitHub that you can look at some very basic, uh, basic building blocks for doing this kind of stuff. So how to do the uh, generate key pair, how to do issue a self-signed certificate, how to issue a, a certificate signed by the other certificates. Uh, usually a root certificate is the one that is self-signed, so it needs to be trusted so that the whole chain is trusted uh, uh, after that. And, uh, and how to give a signature, for example, in a plain bytes and in a CADAS uh, format. And uh, when you use the Bouncy Castle uh, like representation of the signatures, they all implement a nice uh, two string that you can actually print and see what's inside, uh, what kind of data. So there was one guy who asked how to look at the certificate, so it's quite easy to extract it from this uh, XML file, for example, for, from BDoc and uh, give it to the code that uh, I have here, parse it and then you can print it uh, in a uh, nice format so you can read what uh, actually is inside. So thank you, I hope it was interesting. How can you be sure that uh, your private key will uh, never be extracted from uh, uh, the physical card? Uh, if you're talking about Estonian ID card, then this is guaranteed by the inputs and outputs of the card. So there is basically no uh, function, no uh, a command for the card that would return you the data. So the card is built that way, so it can only generate it, store it inside, but it will never give it back. So there was some research who have actually opened the smart card and uh, started looking at the transistors in the electronic microscope and they said that uh, theoretically it should be possible uh, looking at the states of these transistors to actually derive the actual bits but uh, in practice it's too difficult and your card will be destroyed after that so, so nobody can copy it. What about all these action movies which are inserted that duplicate and focus? You know, you know everything about the movies already, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one yeah. more question. Thanks for an interesting talk. I have a bit like a different question. So I understand Estonia when banks are actually implementing this uh, like uh, digital signature because it's already on the government level. What forces a bank, for example, in Russia to apply a digital signature for their customers because it's a really complicated process? And is there other simpler way to achieve the same level of security? I don't know, like two-factor authentication, two authentication and some kind of some additional stuff. Very, very good question. Uh, not, none of the Russian banks, as far as I know, uses the digital signatures for login. 
So for login day or authentication, they use uh, two-factor authentication. Most of them use actually SMS codes. So you get the code by SMS or some other means. So what forces them? Uh, private persons, there are very few of them who actually use that. It's mostly for, for companies. And uh, it is actually, uh, according to the laws from, I think, the last few years, is that uh, in order to move uh, certain amounts of money, there is a limit below which you can use other means and uh, upwards of which you, you need to have a digital signature. Under each transaction, basically. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is that, uh, but the banks are on their own to implement that, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Uh, one question was from German here. Uh, you, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, how safe is the Russian signing and encrypting system? For example, if you compare it to, uh, to Estonia, do you feel that this is safe for the FSB decrypting? If you're talking about the algorithms, I don't know. I'm not the like the mathematician who could uh, investigate the algorithm that they are using. But uh, as far as far as I know, it's uh, actually. It's not that different from the, stand, from the elliptical curves which are used uh, outside of Russia. They just use their own parameters for, for these curves. And uh, actually, it's just the thing that they have standardized that this should be the algorithm that we use in Russia, whatever. Uh, I don't know if it's crackable by the government or not. This is, uh, I don't know. But, uh, but the infrastructure that they use is uh, basically the same. So I think the, from infrastructure point of view, it's uh, as secure as in Estonia. Because there was a rumor about the RSA about 15 years ago that maybe CIA knows the algorithm how to deal with it. The, the thing with RSA is that uh, when you generate the keys, you use the random number generators. And uh, it's true for any kind of algorithm. And the thing is that uh, the quality of the key is very much dependent on the quality of random generator. And if the random generator is not random, then uh, you can actually derive the keys. And uh, uh, that's what, where most of the rumors originate from. So, so maybe there are some of the keys which are generated, they are maybe not <coughs> completely random, and it's much easier to crack them than any kind of key. Or if what? you mathematically solve the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. So if you already know some of the parameters of the random generator, it's already much easier to, to crack the stuff. For Estonia, because the, the key actually is itself is generated inside of the card, then uh, hopefully uh, the government doesn't have the tools to uh, decrypt it. But, but again, I don't know about the random generator, which is inside of the ID card. Hopefully, uh, we don't need to have some cons conspiracy here. Actually, I remember the second question from that guy, is that are there any other means for digital sign signatures? And actually, this, uh, uh, we're actually now developing uh, and another thing, which is uh, in, uh, from a use, user point of view, it's very similar to mobile ID. So uh, basically, the, the good thing as well that most of the uh, recent smartphones from like three years ago and upwards, they have the hardware TSM inside of them, which is the hardware uh, RSA uh, implementation, uh, which is also unextractable. So most of iPhones, most of current Androids, uh, they have it, uh, this module inside of it. You can access it uh, using the APIs provided by the uh, operating system. And you can also give it a command like the ID card. So generate new keys and it will give you the private key. Or it will give you the public key and the private key you will never give it, uh, have it back. So you can basically use the modern mobile phones instead, instead of these USB tokens and cards. And that's what we are currently working on. So we are making an app that uh, will have a much better usability than the ID card or the USB token that will get the push notification with the payment data and you will enter your PIN and confirm your payment. And basically, it, the user experience will be like mobile ID, but a little bit better. Thank you, Anton. It was a really good talk. Thank you.